السلام على نبينا محمد وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين اشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد الحمد لله we begin again our lessons on friday with a new series on a very important topic that every muslim should know the general understanding of because of how it will help them in their deen. And the topic that we're going to take a look at is a topic of al-jarh wa ta'adil, which translates to criticism and praise. Al-jarh means to dispraise or criticize someone, or some book, or some group. Wa ta'adil refers to praising, or recommending a person, a book, etc. And the work we're going to look at is the work of one of our contemporary scholars, Sheikh Abdul Salam bin Burgess Al Abdul Karim, Rahimahullah. And we believe we studied his work before, Sheikh Abdul Salam bin Burgess or Ibn Burgess. Ibn Burgess. Sheikh Abdul Salam bin or Ibn Burgess. Al Abdul Karim, Rahimahullah, Rahmatun Wasi'ah, he passed away, uh, and we'll look at his biography uh, shortly. Due to the time, today we want to do an introduction to the book and the topic of Ilm al Jarh wa Ta'adil, so the student and the person who's listening can have an understanding of the importance of this topic, its rules, its principles. And the next week, Bayd Allah Ta'ala, we'll begin from the book. And the book we were reading was called Al Jarh wa Ta'adil. عند السلف الجرح والتعديل عند السلف Pray, criticism and praise according to the salaf the pious predecessors طيب, this topic is very important because the science of الجرح والتعديل is a science that is designed to help protect this religion from any type of distortion and deviation ultimately in Islam we know that somebody could come later on and try to change some of the teachings of Islam, out of ignorance or deviation. Or, somebody may come and try to misguide the people. Islam, the mechanism to prevent changes in the tradition, changes from any Muslim, or callers who are misguided, is a science. And so, when we look at the title, Al-Jarh wa Ta'adil, Criticism and Praise, this subject, as we'll see, is one of the subjects part of ulum al-hadith, the sciences of hadith. However, it's not specific to ulum al-hadith, as we'll see today. One of the subjects attached to the sciences of hadith. But it's not limited to it. And it is one of the more difficult topics, and also a cautious one, because you're dealing with what? The subject matter is people, their honor, and their status, whether they're reliable whether their knowledge should be taken from them, whether they're innovated or innovators, etc. Tayyip, to begin with the definitions, we have to define our terms. Al-jarh, when we use the term al-jarh, al-jarh in Arabic just means a mark or a wound on the, on, on the body that's caused by the use of a weapon. Al-jarh is a wound. Someone made jarh of someone, literally, he wounded them. Juruh. Wounds. According to the Sana Arab, al jarh it's a mark or a wound on the body caused by a weapon. And so the linguistic definition carries and helps us to understand then the technical definition. If a jarh is to wound the body with some kind of weapon, Islamically or technically, a jarh has to do with, as this is the definition now, Sheikh Abdul Aziz. Bin Abdul Latif, one of the contemporary scholars who wrote a very good book on this subject called Dawabit Al Jarh wa Ta'adil. And other scholars agree that his definition here is the best, or very good definition at least. He says, Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Abdul Latif, died 1421 Hijri. When you say Al Jarh, criticism, it is. To describe, my document closed, 
gonna open it. So we're gonna open this one second off one. On the, the document I was using there close, I wanted to find it again. So we said the Sheikh says it is to describe a narrator with wordings that necessitate the softening or weakening or rejecting of his reports. It's very important. It's a technical definition to describe a narrator. Narrative hadith, narrative anything. With some kind of wordings that would necessitate that we soften or weaken or reject his reports. And what does he mean by this? Is another sheikh or imam uses certain descriptions about another imam which would necessitate that we do not accept his reports. In Islam, we have the sciences of hadith. Some of them came and come and say, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. And we say, this narrator is weak. That's jarah. Why? Because we're necessitating by that that his report about the Prophet ﷺ is not acceptable because he's a weaker narrator. So wordings, to describe a narrative with any wordings that would necessitate the weakening or the softening or the rejecting of his reports. So that's jarh. In summary, criticism, right? This is what we're saying, criticizing someone. A ta'adil is the opposite. A ta'adil in Arabic means to make something equal or to strengthen something or to weigh something against something else. Sometimes you hear the word ta'adil refer to editing or to, uh, to fix something. But in, that's a linguistic that meaning to make something equal. To strengthen something, to weigh it against something else, like balance almost or fix. But technically, if a jarh is to criticize, then ta'adil is the opposite. It is to describe a narrator with words, right? To describe a narrator in relation to their trustworthiness and in relation to their accuracy, using words that would necessitate the acceptance of their narration. To describe a narrator in relation to his or her trustworthiness and accuracy. Two key words there. Trustworthiness and accuracy. Adala wa dabt. How trustworthy is this person? And the second one, how good are they in their memory and their you know, accuracy of what they report? With any type of wording that would necessitate that we accept their narrations. Sometimes you see the scholars, they describe so-and-so as thiqa. Thiqa tun means reliable. Right? Later on, you will learn all the categories. But what's important? Ta'adil is opposite of jarah. You're praising someone, literally. Right? If you want to give me, if you want to take a base meaning, it's praise. And then the science of jarah or ta'adil is the science of part of the sciences of hadith, because the scholars use this system to determine which narratives were acceptable, which were not. Very intricate science. It's a detailed science. It's part of the sciences of hadith. It's not easy, but the science of a jarh wa ta'adil, as we're going to see here, it's not limited to the narrators. You have to understand it. This is what we're trying to get at today. Because we're not in ulum al-hadith class right now. Some people are probably looking and confused. Are we doing hadith sciences? No. We're not doing hadith sciences. We're just talking about jarh wa ta'adil. Because there's a second meaning which we're going to take. Tayyib. If jarh wa ta'adil is appraising, criticizing, and assessing the narrators... It can also be used to refer to who is upon the correct understanding of Islam and who is upon the Sunnah and who is upon innovation bid'ah. Very important topic because this topic is what the Shaykh Abdul Salam his book is about. But before getting to that second meaning, what's the proof for the concept of jarh wa ta'adil? Where did we get it from? What's the foundations? Because if someone will say this science, how do you know it's an actual science in Islam? Well, in the Qur'an, and in the Sunnah, and the practice of our earlier scholars, the pious predecessors, they used to engage in criticizing and praising. Jarah wa ta'adil is in the Qur'an, it's in the Sunnah, it's in the practice of Salaf, wal ijma' al-ummah. Qala Allah Ta'ala, in ja'akum fasiqum, in ja'akum fasiqum bi naba'in fatabayyanu. So the Hujrat Allah says, if a fasiq comes to you, a wicked person, بِنَبَئِن With some news, فَتَبَيَّنُوا Clarify 
or validate if that news is valid. Surah Hujrat, Ayah 6. Ya'akum, if there comes to you, fasiqun, someone who's wicked, not trustworthy. Binaba'in, with reports, what do you do? You don't just take it. Fatabayinu. Firwaya, or kira'a, fatatabatu. Verify it. It means make sure it's authentic. This ayah is one of the many ayat in the Quran Allah teaching us to be careful regarding the news and the reports of people. So it's very important to know this. Islam, we have our own textual criticism within the tradition. Very powerful. Because other religions, they had to develop one afterwards because they didn't have. And the Quran is telling us this. Another example now from the Sunnah. Rasulullah وسلم, one day Fatima bin Qais, may Allah be pleased with her, came to him. And Fatima bin Qais was trying to get married. And she asked Rasul that two men gave her a marriage proposal. Muawiyah and Abu Jahm radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. So she wanted to ask him, which of the two men should I marry? Attention. Someone asks you, what do you know about so-and-so? And they want to get married? You're allowed to say what you know. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he say? As for Muawiyah, he's poor. And he has no property. As for Abu Jahm, and he's very hard with the women. That has many meanings, what he meant by that. But it means he's very difficult, or he has strictness regarding the women. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't encourage to marry her, to marry either of them, but he gave the option of who? Usam bin Zayd. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did he criticize them for certain qualities? Yes, that's jarh. In the, in the angle, no, obviously not regarding their reliability or trustworthiness, because all the Sahaba Udul, Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah, I believe all companions are trustworthy, he's talking about regarding marriage. Which shows you, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is teaching us that etiquette. It's not a ghibah. Some people think it's backbiting. It's not backbiting. And if you consider it ghibah, it's ghibah, it's halal, halal backbiting. But some people, they don't know. There is such a thing. This is one of them. Hadith another hadith is more, more clear than anything. Hadith Aisha from Bukhari, a Muslim. One day, Aisha said a man sought permission to enter the house of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before he entered, he said to Aisha, or he said out loud, Permit him to enter. Allow him to enter. What a bad tribesman he is. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that before he came in. Then when he came in, he spoke to him nicely. Then Aisha asked, Ya Rasulullah, you said what you said about him. And then you treated him nicely when he entered. And he explained that the worst of people in the sight of Allah are those people who other people run away from them due to their bad language. Hey, the point of reference here. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said something bad about him. He said, Bi'sa akhu, akhu al-ashira. What a bad tribesman he is. Is this criticism? Yes. Someone says, Astaghfirullah is backbiting. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam backbite? That's not backbiting then. What is it? What is he doing here? He's criticizing him in a position or regarding something which is permissible. The ulama from here to take the permissibility and, per- and proof for the idea of jarh wa ta'adil. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam criticized him for a reason and there is a benefit behind that. See, Muslims, as we'll come to, they don't know about these things. And because of this, they may understand the subject of a jarh wa ta'adil incorrectly, as we'll get to later. It is not backbiting despite what people might erroneously believe. One more example of this, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was careful with narrations. After the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, one day he was, at, he was given the issue regarding um, the inheritance of a grandmother. And he didn't know any narration on top of his mind. So one Sahabi came and told him about that grandmother receives one-sixth, one-sixth when it comes to inheritance. And this was a hadith from Mughira. He said to Mughira, go and bring someone else who can establish or can verify what you said. Because he's not sure if it's, you're, you're accurately reporting it. He went, Mughira, and he brought Muhammad bin Maslama. And he said, I also heard Rasul Sallallahu said one six for the grandmother. So Abu Bakr took the hadith. See, Abu Bakr Siddiq was careful. He was making sure that this narrator, Mughira is trustworthy, to, just to make sure his accuracy was on point, I need a second. And a second narrator to verify. Here, Imam al-Dhahabi, he writes in Seerah uh, Anam al-Nubala, Abu Bakr Siddiq is the first one to show cautiousness when it comes to accepting narrations. Uh, this is the Asr Muhaddithun, what they do. You narrate the hadith, I need a second chain, and to make sure you're a trustworthy narrator. Abu Bakr Siddiq, Sahab wa Ahl Hadith, right? And so here we take a great benefit that this science has origin. 
And Mimanawi writes in Riyadh al-Saliheen, chapter what is permissible in relation to backbiting, and he mentions a consensus, the jarh wa ta'adil, criticizing and appraising, criticizing and praising narrators, it is not backbiting. And he's not the only one who said that. So we have ayah, hadith, practice of the companions, and ijma'ah. This subject, although this is all established, for many people is an unheard of subject. Because if you don't study the science of hadith, you never probably heard what a jarh wa ta'adil is. You're probably thinking, who's criticizing and praising people? And why? So our scholars in the past, they used to engage in this specifically, we would say, not specifically, but mainly in the hadith narrators, right? But it also applies to other things. And people erroneously thought that it's backbiting. As brothers and sisters, as you know, backbiting sometimes is permissible. But I mentioned six different scenarios at least, as we covered before in different lessons. But the idea that jarh wa ta'adi, somebody speaking about someone else's religiosity, their taqwa, their uprightness in memory, their reliability, it's not backbiting. First proof, the Prophet ﷺ said about that man, what a bad tribesman he was. Can someone fathom Rasulullah ﷺ committing backbiting, a major sin? What kind of corrupted aqeed does that person have? Do the Anbiya and Rasul do major sins? No. Nope. That's one. Imam, Ma, Imam Abu Abdullah al-Hakim, one of the great Imams of Hadith, al-Hakim, author al-Mustadrak, he writes, this Hadith is authentic and it proves, it proves that Reporting about a man's religion, whether he's upright or not upright, guided or misguided, laysa min al-ghibah. Who would say this? Imam al-Hakim, on the great Imam al-Hadith. Al-Madkhal ila ma'rifat al-Kitab al page 138. So this is Imam, one of the Imams who understood the Hadith. It means Prophet ﷺ criticized this man because he was deserving of that, but also it's not backbiting. Because what do we know about the Prophet ﷺ's adab? Kana ab'adu nas min al-ithm. It was the furthest from sin. So first proof. Surah Hujurat, we just read the ayah in Surah Hujurat. Tafsir bin Kathir, bin Kathir, he writes, backbiting is prohibited according to the consensus of the ummah. And there is no exception to that except in the cases where the benefit is more or preponderant over the harm. Examples, a jarh wa ta'adid. And he brings the same hadith, both hadith we mentioned. Hafid bin Kathir, Tafsir bin Kathir, Surah Hujurat, Ayah number six. Important to understand this point because now if someone saw you and you're criticizing this narrator or that or said somebody is not good, they say, Astaghfirullah. He claims to be religious. He's just backbiting people. Right? You might hear this a lot. And we're going to get to a perfect example happened to the Salaf. Imam Muslim, Kitab and Muqaddimah, the introduction of Sahih Muslim, narration 84. You can find us student.com. One day, Ismail bin Uriya, one of the Imams of Ahl Hadith, he was sitting down and a man asked him, What do you think about so and so narrator? He says he's not reliable. They said, Bithabtin, he's not reliable. Another man saw him and said, Ikhtabtahu, you backbidden him. He said, Ismail then, Imam al Hadith, it's not backbiting. But I'm just telling you, he's not reliable. It's not who's Sahih. And he's not the only one. Another man once came to Imam Ahmed, the same thing and said to him, Imam Ahmed was out taking care of the narrators. And we know Imam Ahmed how serious he is in his deen. And he said the same thing as some of you backbidden him. He said, it's not backbiting. Because this is permissible. Some of the salaf would say, Aksu'bar rahimahullah. And it's important to understand, this is not for everybody, right? Before someone jumps the gun and says, oh, this is a practice we can all do. You have to meet certain conditions to reach this level. But I don't know what to misunderstand me. I'm thinking that it's an open door for all of us to sit down and talk about everybody. There's rules and regulations. But the concept itself was known to the Salaf. So, Shu'ab rahimahullah, this great imam, well known in the sciences of hadith and on the kutub of sitta, one day he was told some of his companions, come, let's sit down together and backbite for the sake of Allah. Someone will say, subhanAllah, backbite for the sake of Allah? Speaking about narratives. What's his, what's his intention? To help the deen, protect it from the people, we're not trustworthy. Because Islam... This point here is not about criticizing people just to lower their status or to talk about the a'rab. There's an intent, a higher objective. But if you want to see a great response just to this issue, about whether or not this topic is backbiting, go to Kitab Jami' al-Tirmidhi. What we call Surah al-Tirmidhi. Go to the end of the book, the Kitab called Kitab al-Ilal. There, Imam al-Tirmidhi himself says, 
some people who did not understand Ahlul Hadith and their speech regarding the Rijal, the narrators, and thought that it is backbiting. And he mentioned a whole list of Imams who used to engage in this practice. And then he says that after he mentioned what, what, they, what they were doing, the ulama, he says, Wallahu a'lam illa an nasihatu lil muslimin. He said, Allahu a'lam, the only reason the scholars engage in is for advice to the ummah. This is sincere advice to the ummah. And it wasn't, as people thought, that they were attacking the honor of people or backbiting them. Who's saying this? Imam Al-Tirmidhi, Sahib al-Jami'ah, right? The, right? The, the book of, one of six books of hadith. He writes at the end of, or one of, his, of his book, uh, Sunan or Jami'ah Al-Tirmidhi, has a book on Ilal. Uh, this portion is not in English. I don't think Kitab Ilal of, of uh, Tirmidhi in the back of the book is translated in English because I looked and I couldn't find it. So, but it's there. And why did he mention this? Because at that time, I mean, who's Imam Tirmidhi again? They were in great Imam, six books of hadith, Sunan Ibn Bukhari and others. He's talking about people that time didn't understand what Ahl hadith were doing. So it shows you the ulama understood the jarh wa ta'adid to be for noble cause. Therefore, what is the intention behind criticizing and praising? It is to protect the deen, to protect the sharia from any deviation or deviant people who are trying to mis- uh, understand or distort the religion. And also a sincere advice to the Ammatul Muslimin, the general folk of the Muslims who don't know whose narrator is trustworthy and who's the innovator, who's not. Hadith, we all familiar with Hadith Tamim Aus Siddari, Qal Ali Sattu Salam, Adinu Nasiha. Ulna Liman, Qal Lillahi wa Likitabihi wa Rasulihi wa Ammatul Muslimin wa Ammatihim. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this religion sincere advice. They said to him, O Rasulullah, he said to his book, Right, to Allah, to the, to the Allah, His book, the, His messenger, and to the rulers of Islam and the lay folk. How can you be sincere to lay folk? If somebody is a deviant, you tell them. If somebody is guided, you encourage them. If something is wrong, you tell them. If some book is not good, you, you say, hey, stay away from it. And we'll get to the kalam later, the speech of Sheikh Abdul Salam, that he said it's actually from treachery. As someone knows, someone's misguided, and he didn't tell someone else about that. Sheikh is going to talk about this. This is what we're going to have to understand. Islam is a religion where we have to protect it from other kinds of misguidance. Now, so before someone starts getting confused, Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he talks about in his Kitab al-Ruh, page 240, Al-Farq Bayna Nasiha wal ghiba the difference between advice and backbiting. And if you want, you can see Kitab al-Ruh, the English translation, page 319, this Kitab al-Ruh ibn Qayyim was translated. Allahu alam how good of a translation it is. But it's there. Page 319 and 318 of the English. Ibn Qayyim writes, Rahimahullah, the difference between advice and backbiting. The objective advice, advice is to warn a Muslim about someone who's harmful. This you may do if your advice is sought regarding companionship and interaction with such an individual. And in the Arabic, he actually also mentions a wicked person or innovator or troublemaker or cheater. And this... And he says, the Prophet ﷺ said, and he brings the same hadith we quoted about Muawiyah and Abu Jahm, and he says, if backbiting occurs due to advice given for Allah, for His Messenger and the believers, then it's a good deed. However, if it occurs due to you trying to degrade your brother, then it's a fire that's going to consume your good deeds. And look at that point there. If you're trying to do this in order to belittle someone, to attack their honor, then actually, he says, it is a nar. He said it's a fire that's going to consume your good deeds like the way that wood consumes is, fire by, is consumed by fire. What is he saying there? Backbiting and advice are two different things. One is for Allah's sake, in order for a greater good, and the other one is for your worldly sake or personal sake. When you backbite someone, it's only if, if it's permitted time, it's for Allah's sake. If it's not for, permitted, it's not for Allah's sake. Hence, the concept and the science of a jarh wa ta'adil is not an open door. Scholars put conditions as who and which level of scholar can engage in this. And if someone doesn't meet those criteria, nor fulfills the uh, conditions of the qawaid, we call it, the qawaid, the principles, what dawabit, the rules of this science, you and I, who don't fulfill those rules, or if we don't meet those conditions, us talking about others is considered backbiting. The difference for those qualified, who are going to do it the right way, it is not. But the one who isn't, it is. Imam and now we writes in Sharh Sahih Muslim that it's permissible to engage in criticism and acceptance of the narrators and their speech if a person is from the one who's doing this is from the people who have knowledge and understanding. 
and whose speech will be accepted by others. Otherwise, a person who is engaging this, then it's, their speech is actually haram, backbiting. كَمَا ذَكَرَهُ قَادِ عِيَادُ رَحِمْهُ اللَّهُ As Qadi Iyad also, the great Malik Iskala also said. Because if me and you are not qualified to do it, nor is there, are we people who know the rules and regulations, nor are we people who are advice is solid anyways, then essentially what are we doing? We're backbiting someone. But that's why you may notice at times it gets out of hand. But we are not in the subject of science of hadith. We are in a subject regarding who and when a person knows someone is upon the sunnah and when and how does someone know someone is not. And a person could be yourself, someone you listen to, someone out there in the Muslim world. Muslims have to know who is on the right path and who is not. The ulama then they say, al-jarh wa ta'adeen, you can divide into two types. Number one, narrators and witnesses. See, jarh wa ta'adeen is not only for the ruat, the narrators of hadith. It's also for the shaheed, or the shahid, the one who's going to do witnessing. When you go to court, you have to make sure there's a trustworthy narrator, right? Someone has to assess the reliability of that narrator. So one category is narrators and witnesses. And the ulama don't differ on that one. But where there seems to be confusion, where there seems to be apprehension, where some people seem to be taking reservation, is jarh and ta'adil in relation to the du'at, the callers, the speakers. Because here people feel, some people claim, as we'll see, it's not valid. Jarh wa ta'adil is not only for the ruat. Jarh wa ta'adil, you can say, is for the ruat, the narrators. And there's jarh wa ta'adil for du'at, for the callers. Or you can say a jarh wa ta'adil, which is muta'alliq, which is related to a riwaya, and jarh wa ta'adil that's related to a diyana. One that's regarding narrators, and one that's regarding religion. One regarding the narrators, and one regarding the speakers. So some people, when they hear a jarh wa ta'adil, they think this is what the imams in the past did. It's cancelled, it's finished, the error is done. Anything beyond that is backbiting. That's sahih, is that correct? Answer is no. In fact, we don't know anyone who came with this speech from our ulama who engaged in the science themselves. So we need to understand the point I want to highlight really. Sheikh Abdul Salam's book we're going to study is not about jarh wa ta'adib of the ruat. It's about jarh wa ta'adib of the du'at. Who's upon the sunnah? Who's upon the bid'ah? How do you know? How do you know your practice is sunnah and not bid'ah? Same thing. Who's a muttabi' who's a mubtadi'? It's important. Because these conversations, some may say, is unnecessary. Very necessary. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he say about the end of times? Whoever amongst you lives long, what are you going to see? Ikhtilafan kathira. Alaykum bi sunnati. How do you know that? How do you know you're following the sunnah? Sataftariqa hadi ummah ala thalath wa sab'in al firqa. This ummah is going to divide into 73 different groups. Kullaha fin nari la wahida. All inherited to the hellfire except for one. It's hadith mutawatir, brothers and sisters, mutawatir. Now, the stakes are high, right? Because if you're talking outside of context, it sounds like there's no problem. I don't need to know anybody. I don't know who's on and off it. I don't care. I don't even need to know. I'm going to just worship Allah. How are you going to worship Allah if you don't know who to take knowledge from? And where did you get that concept from? The set of a salah, I never did that. And this is why I want to highlight something interesting. Go to the book, Difference Between Advising and Shaming. Hafid ibn Rajib is a very good book. Al-Farq Bain al-Nasihati wal Ta'yir. Amazing book is translated by Dar sunnah Age 16, he says, now he's in half of Rajab, Alam Hadith, student of Ibn Taymiyyah ibn Qayyim, he knows the field. Because he did the Sharh Idr, he knows what he's talking about. He says, the core principles, Afwan. Further, there is no difference between criticizing the narratives of once of one of the Hadith scholars and distinguishing those whose narrations are accepted and whose are not, and between calling attention to the mistakes and misconceptions of a person who has erred with regard to understanding the meanings of the book and the sunnah, interpreted some aspect of incorrectly or one who adhered to something false. Page 16. Essentially what he's saying, there is no difference, opinion, amongst the scholars and the salaf between doing jarh of the ruat and du'at. No difference. And the one who says there is, alayhi bi Upon him is the evidence. Because again, as we're sitting even now and discussing this topic, some people, may, their hair may raise and say, how oh, are we talking about other human beings in the masjid? Brothers, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the deen of Islam is very serious deen. 
Not so oversimplistic as some people have. Because they didn't understand what is going on. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hadith sahih Muslim, Bukhari Muslim, both. He narrated the end of times. This is Rai Bukhari. There will be callers to the gates of Jahannam. Right? Many of you probably heard this hadith, maybe we didn't. Whoever abides, agrees with them, or listens to their speech, they will go into hellfire too. What is Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi talking about in that hadith? Misguided callers. Today, when you go online, and you see YouTube, all these speakers, you do not think it's easy just to press play and listen. Allah will ask us, Yom Al-Qiyamah, about what we follow as deen, and we are responsible for that. It's not something of a joke. People today, they take it very lightly. Hence why there's so many problems. These topics, the ulama established to protect the deen. And it's the role of the ulama to do that. Actually, it's their job, the ulama. As one hadith proves, that's their job to talk about who is correct or not. So the Shaykh and Abu Rajabi told us here that the idea that jarh wa ta'adil is an old science ended with ilm al-riwayah is not correct. And what's the proof to show that further? Imam al-Sakhawi. I'm going to mention to you a name. Hafiz bin Hajj's student, big student. Imam al-Sakhawi, his name is. He died 902 Hijri. He has a book about this subject. One of the best books of hadith, also sciences, he has Fatul Mughith, the subject of hadith sciences. He writes, refuting a concept someone said earlier, that jarh wa ta'adil has ended by the ending of the era of the, of the reporters and narrators. One of the earlier Maliki scholars said, after the 4th century, it's all closed door. Imam al-Sakhawi says, no, this is not correct. Because jarh wa ta'adil regarding narrators is nasiha, right? Jarh wa ta'adil regarding callers is also nasiha. Nasiha doesn't end any time, number one. And number two, he says the person who we're warning against, or we're trying to protect the people from, it could be someone who's upright, it could be mubtadi, a fasiq. Therefore the ulama have to speak about those things. Because advice never ends, it's a job on the ulama. Fatuh al he mentions this, very important. Why is, he, why is this important? Because some people may see these kind of lessons to be unnecessary, unbeneficial. Taking the view of some of the early Maliki scholars, Ibn Murabit, he's the one who said this, in Maliki, he died around the 4th, about 5th century almost. He said that after 4th century, it's all no fa'idah. Imam al-Sakhawi, Imam al-Dhahabi, Ibn Hajar, the latter scholars, they didn't agree to that principle. And I'll just give you indication that ilm al-jarh wa ta'adil, Regarding the callers is open door. Just take a look at what Imam al-Dhahabi wrote. Imam al-Dhahabi has a book called The, the Mention of Those Scholars Who We Must Return To For Jarh wa Ta'adir. Imam al-Dhahabi died what year? 748 Hijri? So he's latter. He mentions 715 Imams from the time of the Salaf until now his time who you can go back to and ask whether someone's good or bad or narrate is good or bad. Number 706, Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah's time, is there, is there a time of hadith narrators? No. What was, what was Ibn Taymiyyah going to talk about? People of his time. Ah, so they were talking about not just narrators, but even others. Sakhawi himself died 902 Hijri. He mentions 210 different scholars of the past to the present who you could return to for Jarh wa Ta'adil, who are reliable scholars. Number 204, he says, Shaykhana Hafid bin Hajar. Half al Hajr, he dies much later, 852 Hijri. Who is he, who is he critiquing? Calls the past only? It's in his time too. So the idea now is, brothers and sisters, this topic we're talking about now should not be underestimated. Nor should anybody become flustered or confused or scared. And this is why this subject is so important. And because of the time, I'm going to speed up a bit. Jarh wa ta'adil is important for the ummah when it's done correctly. And there is obviously the concerns when people abuse the subject and just attack people's ird for no reason. And Muslimu akhul Muslim, right? The Muslim is the fellow brother of the Muslim. Haram for us, what? The blood, the, the honor, the wealth. We agree. If someone doesn't follow the rules properly, of course. You cannot just backbite anybody. Of course, you cannot just attack anybody. So, we do not say that there are not, we don't deny there are some people abusing the subject or who under the pretext of the subject are just attacking people ra- randomly. Those people are not to be relied upon, or not practicing the science. But we don't throw away the science and the enterprise out the window, just because there's some people who have done wrong. Because if you go to the past, you find even in the time of Salaf, didn't some of them speak against each other, and their jarh wasn't accepted? Did you ever hear about Imam Bukhari saying, that we can't do jarh wa ta'adil because some people do go overboard? 
No, this is a wrong idea. On top of this, the benefit of the subject is to protect us, especially the lay people, from the giving our ear and attention to people who are misguided. For the misguided people are eager to misguide you. Eager, brothers and sisters. Not just they're eager. They want to misguide you. Because they know that the laity are the majority and they don't know any better. So here, Imam Zahabi, as one of the greatest Imams in the subject of the latter scholars, what did he say? He said underneath the biography of Yahya bin Ma'in, فَوَاللَّهِ لَوْ لَا حُفَاضُ الْأَكَابِرُ لَخَطَبَةِ الْجَنَادِقَةُ عَلَى الْمَنَابِرِ He said, وَاللَّهِ لَوْ لَا حُفَاضُ الْأَكَابِرُ he said, Wallahi, if it wasn't for the Hufad of this deen, the ulama kibar, the ulama of jarh wa ta'adil, the apostates will give the khutbah from the member. Yeah, some of us are thinking, subhanallah. Right? In time of salaf, you will not say somebody who doesn't know nothing of the deen of Allah, innovator on the member, will be taken down. Because he wouldn't even get a chance to get up there. He's already known to be misguided. But in our era, brothers and sisters, we don't know what Imam al Suyuti say, Imam al Jawzi. The ulama in the sight of the awam or is the one who gives the khutbah. La hawla wa la quwwata billah. Connect the two brothers. La hawla wa la quwwata billah. Today the minbar, anybody can go on the minbar. And we may say, MashaAllah, Imam, talib in. That time of salaf, not anyone can go on the minbar. The stakes are high. This subject is important. Shaykh Abdul Salam is kitab now. What is he trying to do? He's trying to teach you principles how to know who's guided and who's not guided. This is the book. He's trying to teach you how to be diligent about your religion. And I want to finish with mentioning what the Sheikh actually mentions. Interesting. He says there are two types of people when it comes to the subject of Jarh wa Ta'adil. Two types. One, who their tongue unleashes, is unleashed on everybody. They do Jarh, more Jarh than Ta'adil, but more on everybody. Second group, they do, do, they do Madah, Ta'adil, everybody. Brothers, there's two groups. Jarh on everybody, he says, and Ta'adil, some will praise everybody, some will criticize everybody. The goal is to be in the middle, to know when some valid criticism, when, when it's valid praise. The lay people tend to be on the second group. Somebody may go and say someone's giving a lecture and say, MashaAllah, very good. You wouldn't know, brothers. The shuyukh, that's their job. And it's very important to know. Even though some people might not be comfortable with this, we have to know. This subject is what keeps us away from its guidance. Our deen is the most important thing. So what is the book all about? The book the Sheikh is writing to summarize for us, the book is called Jarh wa Ta'adil and the Salaf, the, the subject of praise and criticism according to the Salaf. The Shaykh gave a lecture and then it was transcribed. He covers the following topics in, in summary. The importance of this subject matter, of knowing the value of when criticism is given correctly and when there is a valid praise. The conditions of the one who is valid or is allowed to engage in this action. The difference between Ahlul Sunnah, the people of Sunnah, Ahlul Bid'ah, and the people of innovation. The difference between a tabdi' and mutlaq, unrestricted in the declaration of someone being an innovator, with tabdi' and mu'ayyan, and specific declaration of someone's an innovator. He says, we're going to learn some things, inshallah, here. Maybe we didn't have clarity before. It's going to help us. And when does someone become misguided? When does someone become mubtadi'? What's the principles and conditions? This book is very good, short, but the Shaykh gave this lecture knowing full well people don't like to talk about these things. But the Shaykh has a responsibility because Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's a hadith, some of the scholars differ over it, but many of the ulama are greater authentic. Like for example, Imam Ahmad and others. يَحْمِلُ هَذِ الْعِنْ مِنْ كُلِّ خَلَفٍ عُدُولُ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that every generation, this knowledge will be carried by the trustworthy men. And what are they going to do with this knowledge? One of the things they're going to do is they're going to, they're going to respond to the extremism of the extremist, the false interpretation of the one who falsely interpret the text, and against the ignorance of the ignorant. This hadith teaches us the job of the ulama is to talk about who has overstepped the bounds in relation to the religion. That's the job of the ulama. So when we see sometimes some scholars saying so-and-so is not good, or so-and-so is good, we should not get angry and offended. This is their job. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said that. Number one. And number two is for our benefit, a deen and a siha. So we don't go and listen to someone, we don't know who they are. A yawm al-qiyamah, we get barred from drinking from the hawl, yawm al-qiyamah. Brothers and sisters, it's a very important topic. People don't even realize how high the stakes are. If you fall into innovation, you will not drink from the hawl, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, that means the Prophet is going to give from his own water tank. From the water, which is sweeter than honey, whiter than milk. The vessels are more than how many there are in the stars in the sky. And some people, angels, will bar them from it. Because they misguided. They were misguided and they changed their religion. 
Allah, this is not a joke to know if you're upon the khair or not. But today what we notice that when people hear this, they say, oh, this is extremism and this is uh, criticizing people's Arab. The only reason some may see this is because they don't even understand the subject. The same person maybe doesn't even know that who they're listening to or what they're following is truly sunnah. You have to be wary. Your deen is your responsibility, brothers and sisters. So alhamdulillah, this subject is a powerful one. Inshallah, today with just a muqaddimah introduction. And the Shaykh's book, he's going to explain with good examples and we're going to clarify some of those points. To finish also, the biography of the Shaykh has a haq over us. We have to give the biography of this imam and inspiration for all of us. Shaykh Abdul Salam is an inspiration for all of us because he died when he was young and he was alim. His name is Shaykh Abdul Salam bin Barjas, Ala Abdul Kareem. And he was born in the year 1370, uh, 1387 Hijri, 1387 Hijri in Medina, in Medina Riyadh, right? in Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia. And the Shaykh, like any other of the students and the people at that time, our time, he grew up right, in, in Riyadh and he studied there and he took the ilm from the scholars and he went through the formal schooling until the Shaykh, finally he made his way for higher education. So he joined the uh, Jami'a, the University of Muhammad, uh, Imam Muhammad bin Saud, and he finished and graduated the year 1410 Hijri. And then the Shaykh... He went for his master's degree, right? The master's degree in Ma'had Ali al Qada, higher judicial studies. Aywa. Aywa. Yeah, we're going to give it here Al Jarh wa Ta'adir and the Salaf. Okay? Barakallah fiqh. And the Shaykh then, he got his PhD in the year 1422, right? And before uh, he finished his PhD, and he became then associate professor. The Shaykh studied with many of the ulama of our time, like Shaykh bin Baz. Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi, Sheikh Salah Fawzan, also he was familiar with him, Sheikh Ibn Jibreel, and many, many others. And the Sheikh studied many of the subjects of Islam. And he had many positions as well. He was, like I said, a professor. He wrote many books. He was, had many positions or posts of doing da'wah. And he wrote many books. Alhamdulillah, I think in our library we have his majmu'ah over there in the back of the library have all his different small letters and essays. Very good books he writes, the Shaykh. One of them is the one we're looking at now. Another famous book that he wrote is Kitab I'lam, Bibad al Ahkam is Salam. Notification about some of the rulings regarding giving salam out to greet people. The Shaykh was a bahith, was very special, good at, at, at research. The Shaykh, Rahimahullah, he died young in a fatal accident, a car crash, on his way back to Riyadh from one of his trips in Da'wah. And his car collided with a camel on the far street, out back of Saudi Arabia. He died at the age of 38. Ulama of our time, pray Shaykh Abdul Salam. Shaykh Fawzan, you can see it online. He says, Alim, Rajul Alim. How old were this? 38. Some of them said if his trajectory, where he was going, he would have become one of the biggest scholars of our time, Rahimahullah. Because when you read his work, you become shocked at that age, at that much knowledge he had. Fatawa he was given, you can see online some rare tapes of the Q&A or the live fatawa he gave. Rahimahullah wa rahmatu So there's one of those ulama who were young, who died young, and it reminds of the ulama of the past, the salaf. Who when you see their age and you see their output, you, don't wonder, you wonder what time they had and what time we don't have. So brothers, Shaykh Abdul Salam, Rahimahullah, I highly encourage brothers to read his works. Shaykh was thabit, firm on the manhaj salafi. Well known for his knowledge, and he was not scared of the criticism of the criticizers. Because when you read his work, he, he would speak the truth. And he wouldn't be shy to refute if it's wrong. Because the person of knowledge. And this is a great inspiration for us because as when we look at the lecture, but the book is transcribed, when we read it, we'll see that Shaykh will talk about some of the topics. Even in our time, you see people have the same kind of worries that we are also dealing with. So inshallah, I, I encourage brothers right, to attend. We'll go over it. I don't think the work is in English, so we're going to have to read it. I'll translate as we go along. And inshallah, we'll benefit from the points. It's not a very long book. Altogether, I would... The print is about 82 pages. If you add all the biography and the, and the introduction, maybe it's about 40-odd pages or so. Ta'ala, but very important topic, like we said. All of us will learn the basics how to protect our deen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to die upon the sunnah. Islam was sunnah. Inshallah, anyone has any questions, we'll take it. Question says, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Is there a book we can follow along? Right now, there is no translation of this book. So what we'll do is that we have to read as we go and I'll translate it. Ta'ala. Yes. The brothers ask, what if someone who fell into innovation died upon it and they're ignorant of it? There are excuses for these kind of people. 
And we'll talk about that. Not everyone who falls into bid'ah, bid'ah falls upon them. Take that as a principle. Not everyone who falls into innovation, innovation, the ruling of innovation doesn't fall on them because there's conditions and there's preventatives. So it's important to know, we're not saying by, in this subject, it's important to understand the subject matter here. Nobody is taking from this subject and study here that we're trying to attack the people and take them out of Islam and the sunnah. No. Nope. What you're learning is the principles to know what is correct sunnah, what is not. When does someone fall off the deen? When is someone, for example, not a good speaker? How did ulama determine these things? Because I'm sure all of us have the same questions. When you hear someone said, said something about so-and-so, and you're thinking in your head, well, how can the shaykh knew that? Or well, why is the shaykh saying that about him? So the principles we're going to analyze with examples. And the shaykh will give good examples about, for example, speakers who are not good and why. Books which are not good and why. How do you know this? So that you are not going to be so naive that you lend your ear to everybody. Right? The Prophet wasallam again, he taught us to protect our deen. I also want to remind brothers that the subject matter we're also taking here, because it is a subject of introduction and learning, you take it as you go, whatever you learn. But we're not going to understand the subject, obviously, at the end of it, that when you finish the lesson, you're going to become, inshallah, doing jarh wa ta'adir yourself. I'm not telling you anyone that, and that we're not, that's not the intent of the class. So sometimes people, they learn this, and they become, inshallah, I learned some things now, and let me go and make tasneef and nas. And they go and find out who's off, good on sunnah, who's not, and they don't even know what they're doing. As the ulama warned, and I highly recommend, if you want a general book, to talk about sometimes the difference between these things, with good ta'aliq, go back to the book I cited, Ibn Mahaf and Ibn Rajab, his book called The Difference Between Advising and Shaming. It, it, it's translated in English with the notes of Shaykh Salah al-Suhaymi, Hafidhullah, from, from Medina. In there he talks, he does, he does notes on the book in English too. There he talks about good advice about the subject matter of when someone is engaged in these things, they have to have taqwa, they have to know their level, right? It's not for beginners, but for me and you, what's our concern? To protect ourselves and our families from any kind of misguidance because we don't know, for example, when is something sunnah and when is something is not. Any last questions? Yes. So when a workplace talking about short kind of workings, we'll talk about it. But it's slightly different to this because here we're talking about in relation to someone's deen, a diana. It's not about someone's mu'amalat necessary unless it's related to that. For example, we know you're allowed to, if someone comes to say, can I take so-and-so as a business partner, you're allowed to comment about it, whether or not this guy is good at business or not. But that's different than the subject matter here, because we're trying to find out, for example, who's upon the good deen, I can acknowledge from, I can follow it, or not benefit from it, who I can't. So this is diana more so than anything, but there is exception even for those things. Like for example, we covered today marriage. There was an example of someone asking you about who, someone's daughter or someone's groom, a groom who's coming to, to propose. And those examples, but it's slightly different. As we go along, we'll see some of the examples. Yes. It's in his book, because he has one of the good, very good books on the subject called Dawabit al Jarh wa Ta'adir, page 13. So I, I brought this again to the beginning to give you the definition. So he said it's describing narrative with wordings that would necessitate the weakening or the softening or the rejecting of his reports. Al Dawabit al Jarh wa Ta'adir. Inshallah, I think it's the one Salatam, yes. So this st- statement, but there's no difference between the criticism of narratives and callers, it's Hafid ibn Rajab, ibn Rajab al Hanbali, and the book that I cited, which was The Difference Between Advising and Shaming, page 16 of the English, you can find it there as well. Ayyub, inshallah, we'll, uh, I think Salatam came in, so inshallah, next week we'll begin. Uh, Bidna Naita Ala, same time. Subhanaka Allahumma bihamdika shadwan la ilaha illa anta, astaghfirak wa tubu ilayk.